morning and welcome to Sunday Worship at Fairfax Baptist Church. Before we uh, get into our time of worship together, I want to take the opportunity uh, just to pass on a couple of announcements uh, that I, I hope will uh, be an encouragement to you. Uh, first of all, uh, it is our desire to let this Sunday uh, be the last of our pre-records. Now, we may have some opportunities to use pre-recorded elements in the days to come, uh, and certainly if there was ever a need for us to go back to something like that, we have learned how to do it. But it's our design to begin next Sunday, that's June 21st, uh, to return to a live stream worship opportunity. And what that means for you really is twofold. First of all, uh, it means that our worship will not be available on Sundays until 11 a.m. We're going to keep that traditional worship hour. That is the hour at which we will return as we begin to do some in-person regathering in the coming weeks. And so we're going to keep our live streaming. We'll continue to do that even as we regather. We're going to keep that at 11 a.m. Uh, many of you perhaps have gotten used to uh, joining our worship time uh, in an early church kind of fashion. Uh, it's usually posted between 8.30 and 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and as always, it remains available uh, uh, for the days and the weeks to come. But beginning next week, uh, we'll have some pre-service music a few minutes prior, uh, but we will not begin our service. It won't be available uh, for you to uh, log into and to begin to participate with until 11. Uh, now, we will send out this week in our email blast uh, some specific instructions of how, again, to make that streaming, that live streaming uh, interaction as uh, efficient and helpful for you as we can. Uh, so if you are not a part of our uh, email blast, if you've not been receiving those, please reach out to us. You'll see some contact information at the end of our service. Uh, send us an email. We'll be glad to add that, uh, add your email to our list and let you know of further updates. The other aspect of, of us returning to a live stream, it is a very real and tangible way of us taking a step towards regathering. It has been a while. It's been weeks. It's really been since the Easter season that your worship team uh, has been on this platform together. Uh, even when we were doing the, the live streaming opportunities, when we first uh, were prohibited from gathering, uh, we were maintaining all of the social distancing protocols and so forth. We'll return to doing that. Uh, but just like a choir, maybe that's been on a break for a while, uh, we actually want to uh, get to know some new equipment that we have purchased to uh, help us stream at a greater efficiency with greater skill. Uh, we also want to just get back together on the platform a little bit before we have uh, the added responsibility of guiding through a, an in-person attended worship. So next Sunday will be streaming only, but it will be a live stream opportunity, and that is at 11 next week. Uh, very soon thereafter, uh, we'll begin to uh, open the doors a little bit. You'll hear some more information. We're going to send you uh, maybe week after next uh, some specific instructions through a video uh, kind of guide through what worship is going to look like when we do return. Uh, so keep that in mind, but just know that we've taken now uh, with the purchase of some new material, purchase of other resources that are going to help us regather in both a joyful and safe way uh, that we're taking steps toward that. And that is, we hope, coming very, very soon. So be praying for us and uh, join with us next week at 11. Well, as we gather uh, this morning, I want to introduce to you the uh, person who is going to be leading us in our time of scripture and prayer as we uh, now turn our hearts toward worship. Uh, her name is Kylie Perdue. Kylie is a college student. She is uh, going into her sophomore year at Randolph-Macon uh, here in Virginia. Uh, she is from Salem, Virginia, and that is uh, the location from which she'll be joining us in just a moment. Uh, Kylie is a ministry student and is a part of student.church. Uh, which is a resource that partners students with uh, mentoring and on-site uh, internship opportunities. 
Because of all of the limitations this summer, student.church is a part of an organization that we're part of, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Uh, they are doing everything remotely. Uh, and they reached out to us and asked if there was a way that we could perhaps uh, enjoy having a student uh, help us learn and navigate. We've had an opportunity to get to know Kylie a little bit. She's been a part of one of our staff meetings already. Uh, we look forward to hearing uh, from her engagement, uh, even from a distance, all the way from the other side, the other corner of our state. And so, Kylie, thank you for being with us in worship this morning. Now, we take a few moments, so let's listen to the word and join our hearts together in prayer. Kylie, would you lead us? Good morning, beloved. Thank you for allowing me to worship with you today. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 100, which reads, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. And for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. As Christ's beloved, we are called to give constant thanksgiving and praise to our God for what he has done for us. This praise should not and will not ever cease because Christ's love endures forever. His love should reflect within us and spread unto others in other times, but is especially crucial currently. We should find refuge in his mercy and the love that God offers and spread it among others, just as his love has for generations and generations to come. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you again for allowing me to be able to worship with this congregation. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be able to spend a day on this marvelous earth, and thank you for providing it for us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be able to worship together. Though we may be physically di distant and not be able to gather together at this current moment, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be able to have the technology and the abilities to be able to worship together. Lord, as we go forward, I ask that you just speak through Pastor JB, that the words that are spoken today are not the words of him, but the words of you spoken through him. Lord, I ask that the message that is shared today is something that you need us to hear and that it'll make an impact on all of our hearts, Lord. As we go forward in the coming weeks, I ask that first of all, you keep everybody safe and healthy. And secondly, I ask Lord that we remember the steadfast love that you have given us and that we continue to spread that love among other people, Lord. Again, I thank you for today and thank you for allowing us to be able to worship together, Lord. I ask this all in your holy and your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, I've got in my hand an artifact. I feel like I need to blow the dust off of it. Uh, I do that just in jest. We've actually been cleaning everything around here, but I, I have in my hands a hymnal. Remember those back in the olden days when we could gather for church and, and sing? Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the things that we're going to have to set aside for a while, even as we regather. But as I was in the text uh, in recent days that I'll call your attention to in a moment, I, I couldn't help but have this, the, the tune run through my mind and then even the words. You know, if you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland and, and gotten on the, the It's a Small World ride, you know, you get off and you got to go listen to something else to get the tune out of your mind, and even that may not help. Uh, this tune stuck with me. Um, and, and I know we haven't sung in a while. I haven't sung in a while. Good grief, it's been forever. Uh, but it's the hymn, it's number 685 in our hymn, the ones we have in our pews. It's Footsteps of Jesus. And that's a simple hymn. We sing it every so often. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me, and we see where thy footprints falling, lead us to thee. And then the, the chorus, footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow, we will follow the steps of Jesus where One of the things that I'm going to miss, I missed it, we're going to still miss it for a while, as I said, is not only the, the theology that some of our hymns, even our, the choruses, the things that 
the things that we sing, they, they remind us of truth, but they also can stir us a little bit. And, and not just the music, not just the sound that hits our eardrums, uh, that can be moving and, 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 and prick at our emotions sometimes, but the very words, listen to, listen to the words of, of really the rest of this hymn, uh, verses two and three say, though they lead over the cold dark mountains, seeking his sheep, or along by Siloam's fountains, helping the weak, that's that place in the scriptures where people would hang out, just hoping and praying for a miracle. Verse 3 says, if they lead through the temple holy, preaching the word, or in homes, it's where we've been lately, homes, the poor and lowly, oh, everybody's home, the least of these, serving the Lord. And again, the, the, the chorus, the refrain, footprints of Jesus make the pathway flow, we will follow the steps of Jesus, where'er, wherever they go. My question to you is, quite simply and quite bluntly, really? Really? <laughs> I mentioned to you one of the things I miss about singing, not only is the reminder of the truth, but the spurring us to action. And sometimes the verbiage of, of the songs that we sing can bring conviction. Because I, as I read this text, we'll get to it in a sec, I, I kept having that that tune and particularly that chorus run through my mind. And I wonder if we really meant the last time we sang that, I don't know when it was, but the last time maybe you sung that song or, or maybe when I just attempted to do it just now, did I really mean that I'm gonna follow the steps of Jesus? I'm gonna be a follower of Jesus wherever, wherever those steps lead me. Keep that question in mind and let that tune echo through not only your head, but hopefully your heart, not the familiar tune perhaps, but that word and that question. You really mean that? I'll follow Jesus wherever? Well, I want to call your attention with that serving as kind of a tapestry, almost like a backdrop to the rest of our time together. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. Scripture tells us, Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and their places of worship, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep, the sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, and in chapter 10, we're not going to go there. I encourage you to read it. You're going to see he, it's where we find the listing of the names. He's called some of the disciples, and now he's got them in place, the 12, and he's about to send them out. But he, he pulls his disciples closer to him, and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And I, as I read that text, again, I could not get that tune. I could not get that chorus out of my mind. Because if we're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, I think we're going to end up joining him where he is here. Now you may think, well, look, that's, that's a narrative of 2,000 years ago. Oh yes, we, it's a great text, particularly verse uh, uh, 37 and 38, you know, the fields are ripe for the harvest, let's pray for those to go out there and bring that harvest in. But I want to think of that, this little piece of this scripture from the, verse 35 and and all the way through 38, because I don't think you can, we, we so often want to just jump to the harvest thing and we forget what brought Jesus to that moment. And, and I want us to journey with him. I want us to let our steps follow in his. And as I heard that song in my mind, as I, as I read this text, 
I wrote down four truths that that jumped out at me. It, they hit me just just came off the page. And I've looked at this text. We've looked at it before together. I'm sure maybe many of you have looked at it. It may have rung very familiar as I read these words. But I want you to notice, first of all, before we got to the harvest part, before we got to the uh, praying for the workers to go out, before we get to the compassion part even, there was what happened in verse 35, where scripture says, I remind you, Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching he's not just passing through. He's not just uh, driving on the interstate, so to speak, where you've got a few exits, like, you know, such and such city, the next six exits. He's going through the, the roads, the main streets. He's going through. He's going through the back roads, so to speak. So often, if you take a family trip, maybe to an unfamiliar place, if you're in a hurry to get from point A to point B, you might get on the, the highway that just breezes you through. But if you really want to see the culture and the community, uh, you take those back roads. And you get a sense Jesus is here, not on the super highway, but on the back roads. He's going to the small towns and villages. And he's not just buzzing through. He is navigating those alleyways. He's going to those places of worship. He is reaching out to those who are hurting. As he goes through, we find Jesus, and here's the word that jumped out at me, engaging. So my first word for you is this, engagement. If we're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, like Jesus, we're going to have to be willing to engage our communities. We're going to have to be willing, and I, I know, and it's one of the frustrations for me as a pastor, you know how... Um, uh, we enjoy connecting with people, whether it's gatherings at our home, gatherings here, lunch on the, the lawn, kind of block parties. We love doing all those kinds of things. And yes, we've been limited. But yet there is coming a day, and even in a time of limitation, perhaps even more so in a time of social distancing, we need to find ways as the body of Christ, as the people of God, to engage our communities. Now, some of you may have said, have you looked out the window lately? I mean, we got the COVID thing going on. We got the other stuff in the news going on. Are, are you sure it's okay to go out? Hey, where our culture is, where our community is, even here in Fairfax, even where you are, right where you live, the church cannot retreat. And if we're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, particularly if we want to see that harvest that we'll get to uh, at the end, there has to be that engagement. And so I'm asking you, Fairfax Baptist Church, I'm asking you, wherever you are in the congregation to which you belong, open your eyes as Jesus did. Because scripture says he goes through and the very first phrase of verse 36 says he saw. Now, the idea of seeing here isn't just something that he caught a glimpse of, but his eyes were open, not only open to what was around him, there was a certain focus in a certain direction. Uh, these words in verse 35, it's a summary. It is a, it is a, a, a macro statement of many micro opportunities that we see throughout the Gospels. Jesus in the home of a tax collector. Jesus by a well outside of a city in Samaria talking to a woman. Jesus uh, reaching out and touching those who the world said, don't touch them. For those who came saying, I want to be healed from leprosy or I want my sight. We find plenty of opportunities to see even names represented but here in verse 35, we're reminded that as Jesus went up and down the alleyways, down the roads, through the towns, he engaged those with whom he met. And I wonder if there are things that we can do. Maybe our eyes need to be open. Are your eyes open to the needs around you? Shortly before we actually had to stop convening and gathering 
There were things that we were looking at doing and even resources we provided for you. It might be a, a business card size invitation for you to leave uh, with a tip at a restaurant or, or those kinds of things. And, and we were asking you, those who are part of our church, and, and I can even hear individuals and maybe names come to mind when they talk about reaching out to those around us saying it's all of our jobs to do. It's not a paid position. I know we've been limited and I know that we've encouraged you, oh, don't go out right now. But in a season in which as we open our eyes, as we open up, I think we're going to see, if our eyes are open, plenty of opportunities to engage where people are asking what is real. Like I shared with you several weeks ago from my rooftop, uh, the people in Athens making sure that they haven't missed anything, really with the subtext, is there anything that we've missed? Is there anything above all of this? Our communities and culture are asking those questions even more so today than they were just a few weeks ago. So if we're going to follow in the steps of Jesus, we've got to be willing to engage. Not to love our neighbor just from a distance, but to seek our neighbor's highest good. That's what love means. But to do that means we respond. Which brings me to the next thing. Before we get to the harvest part, we have to be engaged. But when we open our eyes in that engagement with our neighbors, with the places we go, the people that we meet, when our eyes are focused on those situations, what happens? There's, there's a phrase here that is so important, I think, in understanding what was happening in Jesus' heart and mind as he makes the appeal that is the end of this passage. He says in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he saw them because he was engaged, but when he saw them, he had compassion on them. Now, we're not talking about an emotion. We're not talking about pity or feeling sorry. We're not talking about dropping his head and saying, oh, man, oh, bless their hearts. That's just too bad. No, the, the idea of compassion is it's here that the word that we use, that we translate, doesn't really touch to how moved Jesus was. In fact, in the, the original languages, uh, an apt description of what he was feeling can, has a much more graphic description. Oh, I think it's an appropriate word, but we have watered down compassion to say, oh, I just feel bad about the situation. Compassion, however, is to Come to a point where we are so moved, and I will even use the word convicted. Because the only way that we can share Jesus' heart and compassion for whatever he lays eyes on is for us to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. To see a person, to see a situation, to see a conflict, to see an opportunity, whatever, through divine eyes. That takes the conviction. So if we're going to be moved to action, if we're going to have that same movement within our spirit, that is a spiritual conviction. And are you convicted by what you see? Let me, let me illustrate it for you this way. Um, it's been said that the Vietnam conflict was the first war that was fought in the living rooms of America. Oh, certainly from the Korean conflict and, and World War II, even World War I. Uh, the newsreels, you know, you go to the movies for the matinee for, you know, five cents or whatever, and you get the newsreels and before television, uh, you've got the up-to-date stuff on the radio, but seeing the images of conflicts from around the world, even conflicts that maybe loved ones, you know, you could say, oh my gosh, my, I've got a son, I've got a, a spouse, I've got... I've got a daughter in that place of conflict. By the time they arrived, they were edited. They were um, a part of a promotion to stir us to action. They moved us. But the conflict in Vietnam was a little bit different. And, and there are iconic images, both still footage as well as newsreels, that perhaps for those of you who were alive then, even a part of that, it can't escape your mind. Even as a child, as I watch some of that, I have an indelible 
mark in my brain of certain things. Listening to un Uncle Walter Cronkite and then seeing some of those images. Sociologists and historians say that it was those images that began to turn the tide of, of America's idea of what we're doing over there in Southeast Asia. This is not to refight that battle. And for those of you who served so, so admirably, and even those of you who maybe marched against that involvement, you were a part of a movement in our history. For your conviction, we thank you, and for your service, our sincerest gratitude. But it was seeing all of that play out before us, almost in real time, that moved us. And I have a question for you. Uh, you don't have to go all the way back, and, and maybe some of you are thinking, I've got to go back to my history book for that. It wasn't my life. Without being too pointed or giving specifics, you won't have to think hard, but think just a sec. You seen any images on the news lately that moved you? Have you seen violence? Have you seen persons lose their life? Have you seen property destroyed? Have you seen anger and fear and hope and tears? We may be at a point in our nation's history where that kind of imagery moves us again, much like it did really two generations ago now. And I say that simply as an illustration. You may remember how you were moved by seeing an image on the news decades ago. You may be, uh, remember how you saw in real time one tower burning and a plane flying to one next to it. And you remember how, what happened on the inside and you were moved to action. What can I do? And you, there was fear. There was movement that happened. It was more than emotion. Maybe some of the imagery even of today fits that category of calling forth an emotion. I simply use that as an illustration to say that's the kind of feeling Jesus had that moment. Moved. Because you see, not only was he engaged, and because he was engaged, his eyes were open and he saw something. And with what he saw, he was moved, not with emotion, but true compassion moved to, to make sure that what came next was an attempt to meet the needs that he saw. The third word is the word assessment. Jesus and his divine ability does the work for us. He looks and he sees them. He's moved because this is what he sees. And he has two metaphors. There are two images. He has the image of the flock and he has the image of the field. The first one, and, and I think the order is important. The first one, he says, he has compassion on them because they, speaking of the community, were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That isn't an illustration of someone just tripping over something. This is sheep. The phrases that are used speak of a flock or a sheep or, or a community. Real life people, flesh and blood, who are continually harassed completely and perpetually harmed. He saw an ongoing problem and he was moved by it. The second image or metaphor in his assessment, not only does he see the, the people that he met as sheep without a shepherd, when he begins to speak to his disciples, he tells us another image, and that is of the field. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray that we have workers that respond and go to the field. The image of the flock 
moved by the downtroddenness of the sheep. But at the same time, the image of the field, which came second, by the way, the image of the field showed the opportunity to respond and the urgency of the moment. Because you see, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I do know that if you don't respond within the certain window, the harvest opportunity goes away. The opportunity to, to find fruit from the engagement in the field won't last. And so Jesus says, I, I, I've been throughout the villages and towns. I've been engaged with them. I've been moved by what I saw. And it's what I see. My assessment is they are sheep that are downtrodden. But I also want to tell those of you who are following me, the time is right to respond. That's what he means when he says the harvest is plentiful. We even use that image sometimes from older translations. The fields are ripe for the harvest or ripe for the harvest. Oh, they're ready. But they won't stay ready. There is a moment of the harvest that comes and then it goes. So Jesus is engaged with the communities in which he encounters. With his eyes open, he sees what is is moved by what he sees and quickly makes an assessment of the problem, of what needs to be done. And then he gives the remedy. The remedy we find in verse 38. And it's really a, a twofold reality. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In other words, this is a spiritual matter. There is going to be a time on our knees, a time of prayer saying, God, we know we're at a crossroads. We know that the harvest, both spiritual and the harvest for, for meeting the needs and the opportunities in Jesus' name to be salt and light to a community that's crying out, is this all there is? Is this all that there can be? Is there anything more? We certainly turn to the Lord in prayer, but Jesus says, don't ask God to fix it. It ain't good. But ask God what you need to do. Because you see, when Jesus says, from that engagement, compassion, and assessment, when he says, here's the remedy, if we go on in, in chapter 10, you'll find him encouraging and, and living out and and seeing fleshed out that remedy in the life of his followers. But he tells us what that remedy is here. When he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. There is only one way that there is a harvest. There is only one way in which there is a spiritual harvest. People coming to faith in Christ, for example, we might say it. And there's only one way that there is true fruit of our ministry. And that is through the Spirit's engagement in the situation. So I want you to hear it this way. When you think of the Lord of the harvest, Jesus is essentially saying, join me there. Make certain that as you pray... Know that the one to whom you are offering that petition is working in that moment and invites you. He invites us to be engaged and to join him in his work. What Jesus does for the 12 in, in chapter 10 and following and, and for larger groups even later. Jesus simply says, follow me. Join me in the engagement of our culture and community and our world. Open your eyes and let me show you what I see. Let me give you that assessment. And do you see the harassment and the hurt and the pain? And do you see even in that an opportunity to know that the spirit is at work? And if we are careful, we can be vessels 
of not just pity on a situation, not just wanting to turn away from it, but as Jesus being moved and moved to meet the needs that he saw. Jesus invites us to join him in the flock and in the field. When Jesus says that the time is right, another way to understand that is that at this time the Spirit is moving. Are you going to join the Spirit in the Spirit's work? So I ask you, Fairfax congregation, Fairfax individually, heart to heart, home to home, to the rest of you joining with us, will you follow Jesus into the engagement into our world? Will you let what he shows you move you? Will you listen simply to the assessment that really hasn't changed over the miles of the millennia. When we hear the remedy, come join me. Come join me. Come join me. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. I don't know what that's going to look like for our church. And certainly there are things we still have to navigate related to the medical issues and concerns that we face. But we don't have to think back in decades gone by to see on our screens or even on our windows. The very hurt that Jesus saw. The appeal remains the same. I believe the spirit is moving I mentioned to you weeks ago, seems like years, but on the, I think it was on the very first day where we said, you stay home, and we did a live stream, we didn't know what we were doing, the words were backwards, all that kind of stuff, took some young person and said, hey pastor, turn, turn the camera around, oh, okay. we know what we're doing. And all of us were confused. We didn't know all the things that sounded scary, this virus that's out there. And, and I said something akin to this. You can go back, and uh, that's probably in the archives on Facebook. But I made the comment. I said, I don't know who the they is, but they are watching us. This is a test for the church. And I used the illustration and we had some military personnel even in the, in the room that day, and I, I double-checked before I used it. I, I said, I think we're in a live-fire drill. And, you know, there, there could certainly be a worse pandemic. There have been, and there may will be, well be in the future. There may be greater conflicts that face our culture and community. And, of course, now we have the economic hardships brought around by the things that we had to, to, to do to address the, the medical issues. And I said at the very beginning, I said this, this very thing, and the COVID-19 stuff, this could be like a live fire drill for the church. How are we going to respond? And what is the community going to see when we respond to that need? Little did any of us know that it only weeks and still even in the midst of that pandemic, There's another live fire situation. Well, I didn't mean to belittle the COVID situation. It's not a drill. It's real. But what we face now, I can echo through the alarm. This is not a drill. Our world is hurting. And they need us to follow Jesus. To engage, to be moved, 
assess, and to join him in where the Spirit is moving. I don't know what it's going to look like for you. I don't know what it's going to look like for us in the days to come. But just like the season of harvest referenced here, it is a window of opportunity that quickly fades. So I, that's why I had that song in my mind, Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus. Where they go. Really? Thanks for joining with us in worship today. Be sure to stay connected by following our Facebook page at Fairfax Baptist of Virginia. If you want more information on the church, including how you can donate or sign up for our email list, go to fairfaxbaptist.net. From Pastor Joby and the rest of us at FBC, thanks and have a blessed week.